Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and in this video we're going to be talking about the Ham That Rides, Stannis III, also known as Stannis Baratheon, King at the Wall. So I know I usually start these videos off with the little blurb of fluff that's on the back of the box. Um, I think I'm going to save that one for the actual review for the Heroes 3 video, but I figured Stannis was kind of deserving of his own... Uh, commander discussion, plus I think it was requested in the comments that we talk about him, so I am giving him his full credit of just having a straight commander talk video about him before we dive into the details of his hero box. So we'll hop right in the saddle with uh, Stannis's commander attachment, and the first order he brings along is Insight. This triggers when this unit is performing a melee attack before rolling attack dice. This attack gains Vicious and rolls its highest attack die value. We also get the ability Stubborn Tenacity, which states each time this unit passes a panic test, one enemy they are engaged with suffers one wound. And then we have, uh, unsurprisingly, the Stannis Baratheon Loyalty, which states your army can never include units or attachments with different loyalties. So within Stannis' commander attachment, we have a couple recurring themes that we've seen in previous versions of him, and that's mostly getting some durability through uh, morale, where we have stubborn tenacity on this one, just to make sure that uh, a unit doesn't, uh, or is a little bit more resilient to panic checks, right? And then we also have some morale kind of uh, shenanigans where we get vicious on a unit and then can roll our highest attack die value. So Stannis already just built in on his card has quite a bit of attritional value in that he can push the attrition over with vicious and then make sure that he's keeping his unit around longer by making them a little bit more resilient to panic checks. So it comes down to figuring out what kind of unit you're really wanting to get in get him into to take advantage of both of those items but let's go ahead and take a look at his commander cards first so we can establish the full picture of what stannis is trying to bring to the table here so looking at the first card of stannis's three is going to be muster uh, this triggers when a friendly cavalry unit is performing a retreat action before rolling retreat distance dice enemies this unit disengages from cannot pivot after this unit completes a retreat action it may perform one maneuver action if this targets Stannis Baratheon's unit, it also restores D3 wounds plus one wound for each one of its destroyed ranks. So Muster is an extremely powerful card. This is a unique card, a, you know, a new commander card, which I'm really happy for. I think Stannis has two unique commander cards, which uh, is really cool since we have seen some of those get recycled throughout some commanders before. But Muster is extremely potent. You're... You have to do the retreat, right, which might not be the worst thing in the universe because uh, you can at least take the maneuver position because once you kind of get into the thick of the game in the middle of it, uh, your opponent's probably less likely to try and take that kind of position from you or take that position on the tactic zone. So you having muster gives you the ability to retreat out without having any big issues. And if your unit has taken some damage, you're able to, well, mostly if Stannis's unit's taken damage, you're able to restore a pretty hefty amount of wounds to a cavalry unit, especially considering most of the cav units that will be putting him are a little bit more resilient. And then not being able to pivot is massively huge. I don't think it can be understated. I think we talked about it a little bit in the, the Bog Devil video. But being able to take an extremely maneuverable unit and then just make sure your opponent can't turn around at all. And then on top of that, you're also getting a little bit more positioning value out of this card by by being able to retreat and then take a maneuver action there's very little chance that you won't get into the rear arc of someone and if you're taking the cavalry position to do this or the maneuver position on the tactics board uh you're likely going to be able to get a charge off with this unit too and in the rear makes it so that if you're stacking vicious and putting some other cool abilities on the unit and rolling your highest attack die value uh and that's mostly with stannis specifically you're going to be able to do a ton of work uh, with just one cavalry charge, and it all comes off the back of muster. So I think uh, a lot of Stannis' cards are quite powerful, but I think muster here is probably one of the most ridiculous ones he has, and I think it could definitely drive some people bonkers. Because the other, the, the other thing that needs to be mentioned about muster is that if you're taking the maneuver position on the tactics board to retreat, your opponent has to waste that unit's activation to turn around if they don't want to just get punked in the butt so to speak so uh it just is a lot of value on this card and it, it can't be overstated how amazing it actually is for a stannis led army 
Next up, we have another unique card called On the Double. This triggers when an unengaged friendly cavalry unit activates. Once this turn, if that unit performs a maneuver action, it gains plus three speed for that maneuver action then the unit becomes vulnerable. So I can see where some people might find this card a little bit underwhelming because you are sticking vulnerable on a unit that likely is going to be very unhappy that it's vulnerable because they hang their hat on a lot of their defense capabilities and vulnerable is a way to get around that. But uh, Baratheons have plenty of ways to get rid of uh, condition tokens, so I'm not overly concerned about the vulnerable that goes on the unit. But things to pay attention to here is that uh, you don't have to use this maneuver buff on your very first maneuver action. So um, it allows you to kind of get some extra distance up the table if you're trying to close a gap or can help you get to a position on the table where you need to take a, an objective or go for a, a unit that might be trying to get away from you. But the another key thing to focus in on here is that it's any of your maneuver actions. I think I probably already st stated that, but um, this can be your free cavalry maneuver that happens. So you're able to maneuver your speed plus three and then take a charge action. So it's a really big threat extender. Um, I think the small price of having vulnerable on your unit makes this card really good for being able to crash in that alpha strike. I feel like Stannis is much more aggressive in a lot of his play patterns than uh, than Renly is, and on the double really leans into that and makes sure that you're going to get that alpha strike off. And if you're putting the right units into your opponent with this particular card, uh, you're going to be doing a lot of work uh, because a lot of these cavalry units that we have are extremely dangerous. So the final card that Stannis ends up bringing to the Baratheon deck is a recycled card from the Mounted Blackfish, and that's going to be Ride Them Down. This triggers when an enemy ends a maneuver, march, or retreat action. You target one friendly cavalry unit in long range that can charge that enemy. It performs one charge action on that enemy, and if, successful, or if it successfully charges that enemy, instead of performing a melee attack, the enemy becomes panicked and suffers plus two hits for each remaining rank in this unit. So Ride Them Down is a pretty fun card. I know that we've seen it on Mounted Blackfish, and I'm not the biggest fan of it there because there aren't a whole lot of, you know, I, I guess like Starks just don't have a ton of, um, like, engaged in combat bonuses. Like, they want to be charging, they want to be moving around the table, and they don't have a ton of panic business. So, like, this card kind of feels a little harsh for them unless you're doing something like Flayed Men and trying to get it to go off. But for Stannis specifically, we do have, even on just his commander card, the a way, a way to get Vicious going and doing more panic work. So if your, if your panic check is just like not really great or the morale test that you enforce on your opponent, he just passes it or he or she passes it amazingly and you don't really want to spend that panic token, you're just trying to fish for some extra damage, then you can wait for Stannis to attack or whatever unit you're having charge in that has a vicious attack so that you can use that panic token later. Also, if they just happen to fail it, then extra wounds is extra wounds. But ending up inflicting an extra two auto hits on, or up to four auto hits on top of that is pretty decent. It's just being able to get extra hits out when your opponent's trying to project themselves forward. Now, this could even be something that you use to bait your opponent, because if you activate a cavalry unit, move them to where your opponent might want to close in within long range, and they're like, oh yeah, that unit has activated, so I'm not worried about it anymore. You can go ahead and do ride them down after that opponent's you know, ended their maneuver or whatever, get your your plus four auto hits and then panic the unit. And then hopefully if things plan, pan out right, you take your combat position or the swords position on the tactic zone and then attack them. And they just take a ton of punishment for just choosing to move up the table. I think Ride Them Down has a lot of potential as another one of those alpha strike type cards. And if you're playing it right, you can... Have this whole ride them down concoction happen and then follow up with something like an on the double charge to make sure that the unit that your opponent presented forward is likely to just get wiped by two pieces of cavalry that can then, you know, one surges forth and can get into a better position. And it just really sets up this domino effect for your opponent having a horrible time just for trying to get up the table. So I think that ride them down in the Baratheon army is extremely valuable. 
So I've got a couple different lists here. One I think is more cute than good, but is a lot more fun. And I think that's the one we're going to be building around right now. But regardless of which which type of list I'm deciding to build with uh, Stannis King of the Wall, or King at the Wall, sorry, uh, I think that Champions of the Stag is really one of the units that he feels really comfortable in. Uh, the, the unit uh, Champions of the Stag is... Extremely defensible, and with the 5 plus morale, Stubborn Tenacity is going to make it so that this unit is not typically going to be losing wounds through panic chests or th through panic checks or morale tests. They hit on threes and have a 7 5 attack stat, which is pretty decent for them. Uh, and they also get critical blow and then have a host of abilities in that Champions of Wrath, where if they happen to be engaged, the unit that they're attacking becomes vulnerable. Uh, vulnerable. And that's really. Uh, important with something like ride them down where if these guys get a chance to connect first before they end up taking an attack uh, you can make sure you're getting the full value out of uh, out of the vulnerable token and they don't really need to worry too much about the rerolls it's nice to be able to fish for critical blows but with vicious and uh, rolling your highest attack die all the time and then vulnerable on top of that means that you're probably going to balance out when it comes to the amount of damage you're doing Speed 4 isn't super great, but uh, we do have on the double to try and get them into a better position. So I think that the champions of the stag feel like a really good place for Stannis. It gives them some extra push forward where they can crash through your opponent's regular defenses and then do some extra damage on the panic test. Uh, so the only thing holding them back is their speed, but the amount of survivability you get out of this unit is really great. Plus, you can take full advantage of pretty much everything on Stannis's card because, uh, you know, they don't have Vicious, so you're not putting a, an ability on them that they already have. I could see maybe an argument for putting Stannis in something like Hedge Knights because getting Vicious and Sundering is pretty good as well, but the survivability of that unit is a little bit lower when you don't have the... Uh, the coin position on the tactics board. So the champions of the stag just make sure that Stannis stays around for a long time, and doubly so because you get an extra way to heal them with uh, muster. And healing champions of the stag is definitely a morale-busting point for your opponent, so I think these this is just the unit that I really like him in. So speaking of hedge knights, I am bringing a unit of those along with me. They uh, have very similar stats to the champion of the stag when it comes to their melee capabilities. 7-4 is pretty negligible when compared to 7-5. Speed 5, again, a little bit on the slower side, but with maneuver or with uh, um, on the double, you're able to get that extra threat po that threat projected out there. And speed 5 on cavalry is not bad by any means. 4-7 isn't the greatest stat in the world, but with loyalty through coin where they get plus one to defense dice and morale tests, uh, it means that they are they have two positions that they really like on the zone. It's being able to put out vulnerable tokens with having the combat zone and then getting that buff to their stats through the coin. And typically, you should have one, if not both of those in, in most given turns, or not most given turns, but like the... the uh, the combat position is going to rotate through players for the most part, but then the coin position probably is going to rotate also. Your opponent's going to want to stop you from taking that because healing cavalry just always feels bad, but you're going to be able to get that when you want it at least. So uh, I think that the hedge knights feel really good in this particular army because you get base sundering, so you're able to push some extra damage where some of your other units might not have those modifiers. And then for fun, I've decided to put a Dragonstone Noble in with these Hedge Knights. Because for one point, he brings the Order Sentinel, which states, After another friendly unit in long range is attacked, this unit performs one charge or maneuver action. If charging, it must target the attacker. So the reason why I like the Dragonstone Noble in a Stannis 3 list is that you have so many ways to kind of mess with the... Uh, table state in terms of positioning that being able to have the threat of another cavalry unit charging in when your opponent decides to punch you just feels really good so if you do something like you go in with ride them down attack your opponent and then the next turn comes around they take a punch at you you just have this dragonstone noble proc that sentinel order and charge in possibly wipe the unit considering all the damage you've done to it already and then you're both of your cavalry units are still ready and raring to go. So there's a lot of 
potential for another activation out of this unit for one point. And I think that that is quite powerful, especially if you're trying to more brick up or keep a lot of your cavalry units together to kind of move as one and fight as one full army. You're just kind of like plowing through units one at a time with multiple cavalry units. I think it makes uh, that type of tactic really strong. I, I feel like with Stannis running around with another unit with a Dragonstone Noble, you've really got this nice double team potential that is that can easily wipe out units with the activations that they get. And between all of Stannis's tactics cards, you end up getting enough extra oomph to be able to do that quite regularly. And if one Dragonstone Noble wasn't enough, I am bringing a solo Dragonstone Noble in here because he does benefit from on the double as well, where you get that, you can kind of mitigate that four speed really well. And three attacks hitting on threes with an amazing defensive stat of two plus defense and three plus morale means that it's going to be hard to really move this guy around and your opponent just can't randomly snipe him out of nowhere with particular uh, like crown zaps or something like that. It, it's happened to me before, but um, that was unfortunate. Anyways, uh, with three wounds, you end up getting sundering and then you're dealing a couple extra hits for every wound that the unit suffered now we don't have the ability to just make that happen with something like the melisandre thing where you can damage the unit to uh to get those going off but if we're careful about things or put him into units where they're unlikely to do a lot of damage to him we might be able to get that as we go along through the game but three attacks on sundering for four points on a cavalry unit is pretty decent Another big thing here is that we have another Sentinel that's presented in the army. And with the way that Stannis is moving around and how maneuverable the Dragonstone Noble can be with the smaller base size means that he can also kind of tag team along with them. So if the Hedge Knight Dragonstone Noble like team up isn't doing the work that it needs to, you've at least got a Dragonstone Noble that can maybe get some extra work done. And uh, I just feel like the other thing that it brings is it's a four point unit that can sit on an objective when you don't have a job for it to do. And I think that's extremely beneficial just on its own for this type of list, because we are going a little bit more narrow with our units. So the final combat unit that I'm bringing along with me is a, is a funky one, but it's the Bloody Mumber Zorse Riders. So for six points, we end up getting the most uh, maneuverable unit in this army at speed six. Now with on the double, being able to get a nine inch maneuver right away feels really good. And then being able to charge off of that or be able to, uh, you know, get, what is it, like a 21 inch maneuver or march off of all of that and get them into the back of the table where they need to be feels really decent for them especially in that mid game where you can just take this really huge positional advantage by rocketing nine inches forward and then shooting over another 12 inches with a march just gets them ready to kind of uh, do cause a lot of chaos in the back of your opponent's army but they um, the, the big thing for these guys is that with on the double and a uh, muster, they have a pretty good chance of being able to get into the flanks and rears. And when they do that, they're turning off abilities on units, which Baratheons don't seem to have a whole lot of ways to do, at least with this list particularly. So having something where you can control a unit that really hangs its hat on its defensive specialties that are that come through special rules is quite valuable. And then just being able to go to a 7-5 attack stat with critical blow when you're charging on the flank or rear is also really good we're getting up to like now we're looking at a pretty comparable uh comparison to a comparable comparison brian g's we're looking at something that looks quite a bit like the offensive output of the champions of the stag also elusive escape is pretty decent as well if you are doing something like muster not only can your opponent not uh pivot in general but then they're going to become weakened which can help your unit stick around a little bit longer plus just being able to get these guys charging in and then retreat uh on their own accord is pretty decent as well it's just being the the theme of this list is really something that baratheons don't do in general for the stannis side and that's really abuse the table and i feel like the bloody mummer zorse riders really lean into that and again it gets you another cheap cavalry unit that can sit on a point if in the worst case of scenarios right like that's the worst thing they do and that's pretty decent when you're only playing four combat units you want to make sure you have something that can sit on zones while your other units go off and kind of cause a lot of pain 
Additionally, I did put a Glory Seeker in this unit because I, I feel like it's a crime to not have a Glory Seeker in a cavalry-based army. I feel like anytime I have a cav unit, I'm, my first my first question is, is there a reason not to put a Glory Seeker in here? And for this one, the Bloody Mum Resource Riders are likely going to be attacking quite a bit. So being able to have the Glory Seeker in that unit to make sure that we can Rally Cry to get more healing around, it just makes sure that all of these cavalry units stick around for a really long time. And with something like your 2-plus saves on the Champions of the Stag or 3-plus save on the Hedge Knights, uh, it can get pretty annoying for your opponent to deal with that much healing between all the healing Baratheons do normally, and then you have Muster on top of it. So uh, the Zorse Riders with the Glory Seeker seem like they're going to be an interesting unit, but uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how it plays out on the table. So now we can come up to my NCUs in this list, and the first one that I'm bringing along I feel like is a four-point auto-include with Stannis three. If you're playing with at least two units of cavalry, which you should be doing at the very minimum for Stannis is having two units, that Davos Seaworth, Hand of the King, is something that you absolutely want to have. Stannis is so good at putting on the pressure, and you cannot afford to fail a charge with him. So the reason why Davos is feeling really auto included with him is that we get the ability Smuggler's Cunning. Davos begins the game with three order tokens on him, and then each time a friendly unit charges, after rolling charge distance, you may remove one token from Davos. If you do, you reroll any charge distance dice. And then each time a friendly unit activates, you can remove one token from Davos. And if you do, until the end of the turn, enemy, enemies engaged with that unit cannot use orders or be the target of friendly tactics cards. So Davos brings so many things to the Stannis list. We have the rerolling charge distance dice, and then we, we do have to be a little bit cautious with how we use these tokens because the second version, the second mode of what Davos can do with them, allowing you to shut off orders and stop your opponent from targeting a unit with tactics cards is huge. This is something that your opponent cannot interact with, period. Like there's nothing that will stop stop someone from no one can turn off Davos's order here. I mean, you can try and kill him with one of the many NCUs that seem to disrupt that way. Or I guess if you have Olena, that will shut him down too. But uh, I think that in general, Davos just seems like value town with Stannis. He can make sure you get the extra damage across that you need to and can also make sure that you're not flubbing any charge rolls because there's nothing like activating an eight-point cavalry unit and then having them roll crap on their charge distance. So I feel like Davos is just something that you always have in a Stannis list. He's just so good in, in with what he brings. My second NCU is someone that I have a really hard time leaving on the shelf whenever I'm building a cavalry-focused list, and that's going to be Tycho Nestoris, the Iron Banker. So for five points, we get the ability backing of the Iron Bank that states once per game at the start of any turn, you can restore five wounds in total across any number of friendly combat units. So sometimes you might find yourself in a position where a cavalry unit is in quite a bit of danger of getting shot down by your opponent and I mean just getting killed by your opponent because they might have taken some damage and you have to pick between either trying to be aggressive this turn or being more defensive in that you need to take the coin position on the tactic zone and heal. Tycho makes sure that you don't have to make those sacrifices he just gives you everything you want. You can go ahead and use his once per turn or once per game ability and then fill your unit back up, and then still do the offensive thing that you want to do to maybe stop your opponent from taking the coin to heal a unit that's almost dead. And that feels really good. The other thing that Tycho can do is make sure that you restore eight wounds in one activation by taking start of the start of that turn, you restore five wounds wherever you need it, and then you take the coin position on the NCU board and then heal another three wounds and again a lot of the units that we're bringing here are extremely survivable so when your opponent's done some of the work to them to try and whittle down their wounds doing something like restoring eight wounds is just backbreaking and even though Tycho's five points for just his one shot deal I think he swings games so much that he's really hard to not take in a list that has all of this high value cavalry in it I even take him Mostly I'm taking him in like my Targaryen lists where there's either dragons or cavalry, and that's like low wound or low value cavalry. 
and uh, that just prints money. And I think that that's kind of like the the theme of the Iron Banker here is he's just printing money by being in an army where you can put so much value into healing by making sure that your cavalry units stick around. The third NCU that I'm bringing in here is kind of more of a, a wiggle choice. You can kind of do what you feel like with this slot. But for me, I'm bringing along Shira Errol, the Lady of Haystack Hall. For four points, we end up getting support of the support of Haystack Hall that states each time Shira claims the crown, you can restore one wound to one friendly combat unit. Each time she claims the missive, she can remove one condition token from one friendly combat unit. And then each time Shira claims the coin, you can remove a if you remove a token, you can place one condition token of that type on another combat unit. So Shira here, I feel like we're getting the extra healing out of the crown if we want to take it and want to try and push a little bit more damage forward on our opponent, especially since Ride Them Down can get a panic token out that we might not have had otherwise. Um, additionally, being able to remove more condition tokens from our units by drawing extra cards is nice. Stannis's cards are extremely valuable, so you want to be taking that missive position on the NCU board often. But when you do something like maybe muster one of your own units and then get that vulnerable token out, then have Shira claim the tactics position, remove the... Um, and then you can remove the, um, the vulnerable from them. Additionally, in that same type of... Uh, vein. If you take the coin to heal up a unit and get rid of that vulnerable token that was put out on you by a uh, muster, then you're able to go ahead and throw that vulnerable token on someone else. So there's value there as well. So I think that she's good enough to where she's got three zones she wants to take to get her extra abilities. And each one of those abilities is pretty decent for Stannis's army. But again, I could see her being switched out for any other four point NCU and I wouldn't like cry over it at all. But I feel like she's pretty decent here. So I think some people might be a little bit turned off by the fact that there are only four combat units in this list, and one of them is like half a combat unit. But the three NCUs is really important here because it allows me to kind of keep my cavalry sitting in back, kind of chomping at the bit, so to speak, waiting for my opponent to activate something. So I can, in the early turns and in the early parts of the game, I can activate my three NCUs first and make sure that uh, I can force my opponent to present a unit forward that they might not want to be presenting and then I can just pounce on it and try and get it off the table within two or three activations pretty easily uh, if all things kind of align. So I think having the ability to get three MCUs in this list is really important to make sure the list functions the way it's supposed to. I know I said that this list is more cute than good but I think if you pilot it properly and go into the right type of situation for this list that it could be quite potent in the state that it's in right now. So that was my maybe more cute than good list. So my list that might be a little bit more interesting for some players is going to have Stannis still being in a Champions of the Stag unit, but then I and I, I still bring a Dragonstone Noble with me. But then the changes that happen is that the House Bolt and Flayed Men come in with the Glory Seeker. And with them, it's just being able to get an extra way to put out some morale. And if you're doing the buddy cop stuff with with the, with the Stannis' champions and the House Bolt and Flayed Men with the Glory Seeker, the Glory Seeker is keeping Stannis' unit topped up. And then uh, the, the uh, Intimidating Presence is making sure that Stannis's Vicious gets a little bit more value out of it. So you're able to really use these two to bulldoze through your opponent's army, especially if you're playing against something like Free Folk. This combo can be quite devastating. Even against something like a Mance-led Free Folk list, you're able to try and wrap around them a little bit and get into... Uh, the flanks of where these free folk are kind of propagating, and then you can just kind of one by one take each unit of uh, free folk down. Like, like Mance can't be everywhere, so this ends up being a pretty potent combo, in my opinion. The two things that the other things that really change in this list is I think we end up dropping Shira Errol to keep Davos and Tycho, but then we're adding two Baratheon Wardens just to give us a few more boots on the ground so we can start taking points because that really is the big, uh, the big uh, downfall of the first list that I discussed is that being able to actually score points is not something that that list is extremely strong at. It's really good at playing attrition and fighting through the game, but it's not good at playing the scenario. 
Whereas this list might be a little bit better at that, but it's not as flashy. So I like the flashy list a lot more, and it's probably the one that I'll be putting on the table sooner rather than later to see if it kind of plays as fun as I think it's going to. So that rounds out the discussion on Stannis III. I really think that he is an interesting commander for the Baratheons and that the cavalry isn't super strong on his side just yet, so maybe we might get some cool Stannis cavalry units in the future. I really would have liked to have found a way to get like uh, the R'hllor Queensmen in here, but with having them being the only R'hllor unit that they can trigger off of, both of the cards that they can fish out of the deck are really good for Stannis, uh, or, or mounted Stannis, but only having the one R'hllor unit, it's like Stannis hopped on a horse and forgot about the the Lord of Fire, so or the Lord of Light, sorry. And, uh, you know, that's unfortunate. But, again, if you're being really aggressive with your cavalry, it's likely that the Queensmen might not get into the mix right away, and your opponent's not going to be thrilled to be attacking them anyhow. So I think both of these lists are interesting and have some play. Uh, so I'm curious to see what other people are thinking about bringing with Stannis. And if maybe I missed some kind of really ridiculous synergy, but I think I've kind of got uh, a good handle on just about everything here to present a couple cool options to play with this really intriguing commander. So thanks for watching. And again, thanks for all the support for everyone commenting on the videos, kind of pointing me in a direction. I really appreciate the engagement and the motivation to kind of keep me going forward here. So again, thanks a ton. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.